Hey Facebook, am I on? Did I start prematurely? <laughs> okay, so I'm trying to set up my camera and I hit the, the start button. Um, so, welcome. It is uh, Wednesday, live at 5. And I um, appreciate everybody for stopping by. Going to get started um, by sharing this on my page. Page is asking you to do the same thing. Share this, please, on your timeline. Share it with your um, friends and uh, ask them to share it on their timeline, right? Tell a friend. Hashtag tell a friend. So, um, how's everybody doing? I have a um, couple of requests for some folks. Um, I have a Facebook request and then I have a YouTube request. A couple of stories that uh, folks had asked me to speak about, so I'm going to do that. And for anyone who has something that you want to know my opinion on, um, you have a question, you have a concern, you have an issue, you can um, go to Sergeant Dorsey Speaks at gmail.com or you can reach me on Facebook at Sergeant Dorsey Speaks, right? So you can do that one or two ways. If you, um, if you have something that you want to ask me, you have a story that you want to share with me, you have two ways of doing that. SergeantDorseySpeaks.com or here on Facebook. And so thanks to uh, Art who um, shared a, a story with me that I talked a little bit about yesterday on my podcast. You know my podcast drops every Tuesday, right? Different content on my podcast than you will find here on Facebook. So um, if you want to, um, please do, don't want to, please do subscribe to my podcast, Sergeant Dorsey Speaks, on the podcast platform of your choice. And um, I talked about a young man by the name of Terry Whitehead. Art, uh, thank you for sharing that story with me. Terry Whitehead was assaulted by a corrections officer, and um, that was one of the featured stories on my podcast on yesterday. So when you get some time, slide over to uh, iHeart, tune in, Spreaker, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and um, check out Sergeant Dorsey Speaks. And I guess I heard today that um, iHeartRadio is having some kind of a competition situation. And um, if you would be so kind as to go and subscribe to iHeart, create an account, subscribe to my podcast on iHeart, and then vote for me. I guess they have different categories, and I believe one of them is law enforcement. So you can go and um, vote for Sergeant Dorsey Speaks over at iHeart Radio. That would be amazing um, if I could have a couple of fans stand in, agree in agreement with me. I would really appreciate that. So now that everybody's here, or at least a few of you are here, don't forget, share this on your timeline. Let's get right to it. So um, I wanted to start off by... Um, Mentioning again, because, you know, the holidays are coming up and this is a very difficult time of year for a lot of folks. And if uh, you or you know of someone who's having um, a tough time at it right now, who's uh, dealing with some things that seem a little bit too much t to bear, there's actually a helpline that you can text for those who don't feel comfortable talking to someone on the phone. You can text 741741 and that is a suicide crisis line here in the US and you can find someone at that number text number 741741247 and they will um help you and talk to you about whatever it is that that's concerning you so let's be mindful that there are people that are out there in a bad way and it may not be you but it might be someone you know um you know that old if you see something say something if you if you heard something Share it with a friend. 741-741 is the text for the suicide crisis line here in the U.S. only. So, first story I want to talk about, uh, I'm sure by now everybody's seen the video, so I'm not going to put it up, but um, 
Hey, um, Carlos, National Vice Chairman of the NBPA. Welcome in Seattle. I appreciate you, my brother. Um, reach out to me a little later. SergeantDorseySpeaks.com. No, SergeantDorseySpeaks at gmail.com. Let's connect. Would love to, um, to talk to you a little bit more and uh, see if there's some way that we might collaborate. So anyway, back to this uh, video that's going around um, a couple of days ago. Uh, female black in Brooklyn in the food stamp center holding a small child and she was sitting on the floor and she was told by security to get up because you can't sit on the floor and you know things went south you know what happens when the police tell you to do something if you don't do it bad things happen right and so that's why I say comply and complain but what really troubles me is now listen I got some family that's in New York um, Christina <laughs> and um, you know she told me that's kind of how men get down in New York they just sit and look at you if you need a chair they don't they don't really um, feel obligated to stand up because there's a woman in the room and so I just find it hard to imagine that that room didn't have at least one brother who wouldn't get up and give that sister um, a seat it's just unconscionable that they would allow her to be treated the way that she was I wonder uh, the folks that were you know video recording it if, if there were any men in the room. Hey Barry, if there were any men in the room who allowed uh, that young woman to be treated that way and and then listen, what's up with the police officers? Four or five you guys in New York? It took that many of you guys to get this woman up off the floor and then you're trying to wrestle the baby out of her arms? What was the urgency? What was What was so immediate about her getting up off the floor and, and, and letting go of her child. I and mean, listen, I, I get it if sense were common, everybody would have it. And clearly there was not one in that group of four or five officers that had any common sense because somebody should have just said, wait a minute, hold up. Let me have a word with her. Let's say something to her before we just start wrestling over this child. I mean, they could have injured the child in all of that back and forth, back and forth. And so Listen, it's, it's, it was just the optics were very bad. And so now NYPD is looking into it, whatever that means. But I don't know, maybe y'all might need to reach out to um, Bill de Blasio over there. And, uh, oh, Kent, you wish you would have known I was going to discuss this. You would have called. What would you have said, Kent? Type it to me. Let's, um, let's have that discussion right now. Uh, reach out to Bill de Blasio and find out what's going on with his New York officers, why they feel the need to, to deal with a uh, woman who's sitting on the floor. Oh, Mike. Okay, I see NYPD's acting like ice. Yeah, that was way over the top. It was so unnecessary. And, you know, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to fault the young lady just a little bit, too, because, listen, maybe if she would have just passed off the baby to one of them and stood up, you know, it, it, it would not have gone that way. I've said before, you know, like that video we saw a few weeks ago where there was a young woman in the airport wasn't in New York, but there was a young woman in the airport who didn't want to leave. And, you know, I tell you, when the police decide you're going to do a thing, you're going to do that thing. And so why put yourself in harm's way because you want to what? I don't know. Prove a point, make a scene. NYPD president already defended the officers. Are you talking about the um, NYPD PBA? Is that what you're saying, Carlos? Is that the uh, FOP? Is that Pat Lynch and his crew? Who, who's defending the officers? But I'm not surprised that they're defending the officers. I'm, that doesn't surprise me. But listen, people, you know, if you're going to make a stink about how officers are treating you, comply, right, so that you live through that encounter and then complain, complain. Why make your family the beneficiary of those millions of dollars that they do not have paying once they kill you? Wouldn't it be better for you to be here and enjoy some of that money? Get your tuition paid, get you a nice little townhouse. Okay, Michael, yeah, I figured it was Pat Lynch. He hadn't seen, Pat Lynch is the president, I believe, of the FOP there in New York, and he hasn't seen a beating of a black man or, or the death of a black person that he doesn't get excited about. So who's, you know, that nobody's surprised by that. Um, but wh where's the black police officers out there in NYPD? Where's the 100 blacks in law enforcement who care? Um, Noel Leader, where you at? Julian, uh, Vernon, where y'all at on this? 
that should not be allowed to stand. And Pat Lynch's voice should not be the only one that um, that we hear in defense of because it's always in defense of the officers every time that happens. And, you know, I talked about this before. It'd be nice to see a FOP come to the defense of a of a black police officer. That just doesn't happen. But. I'm done asking folks to do stuff for us, for me, and you guys should be tired of that as well. You guys should be ready to get involved, get engaged, and um, start demanding. Start demanding. Hey, Carlos, yeah, I, I talked to Sonia Wiggins. She reached out to me, and um, I left her a message. So when next you speak with her, have her um, check her voicemail. I left her a message. Sorry for doing all this back and forth, you guys, but I'm... Uh, I'm able to finally, uh, you know, walk and chew gum, right? I'm able to talk to you and see what you're saying back to me and all of that. So um, we just, you know, we just going to have a conversation like we're family. So anyway, um, listen, back to the food stamp thing. I'm just very bothered by it. Um, NYPD says they're investigating, whatever that means. Um, they, you know, they may come to some consensus and we may not know what that is when they finally adjudicate this thing. But I think, you know, everybody had a little culpability. And so I need to be fair. I need to be fair. Officers overreacted. They should have de-escalated the situation. And the young woman exacerbated the problem by not just relaxing, relinquishing the child. Hey, Christina. Uh, relinquishing the child and then get, getting to her feet. There has to be a backstory. I don't know what that's all about, you know, with her sitting on the floor, that it was such an issue. And listen, I know that it was the security uh, who initiated this confrontation with the police. It was a security officer. And so, you know, that explains a lot of why that got started, because every, you know, I don't, I ain't hate no security guards, but every security guard, probably seven out of 10 of them, you know, want to be the police. And so they feel some kind of way when they give an order and you don't do it. And so, um, and, and I'm sure that by now they understand that calling the police on, um, someone who looks like me is, um, the thing to do. And they understand what the result will be when they do that. So folks survive the encounter, comply and complain later. The other story that I wanted to talk about came to me by way of one of my YouTube subscribers and, um, I, I didn't realize when uh, the person, and I won't say their name, but when the person asked me to speak on this, this is actually kind of an old story, but I'll just touch on it real quickly. It happened last year in 2017, and there was a young man by the name of Jawan Nicholson, and Jawan and a friend of his were waiting on a, um, they were waiting for a bus or something, and um, hey, Sean, they were waiting for a bus, and there was an off-duty police officer from Baltimore who his version of the story is the kids, the young men were being aggressive and threatening to him. And he pulled out a gun and he hollered Baltimore. And so the young man didn't know what that meant. You know, it could have, could have meant he was with some kind of gang in Baltimore, right? You start hollering out names of streets and cities, but uh, police were called and ultimately they found out that he was an off duty Baltimore police officer. And if you look at the video, uh, it's on YouTube. If you look at the video, I, it, it looks to me like the off-duty officer is also a male black. So I don't know, you know, what that was all about. The young man, Juwan, is a big kid. He's a, he looks like a, you know, what you would call a big teddy bear kind of a kid. He's only 16 years old, but he's a big kid. And uh, he seemed very rattled by the whole situation. And ultimately, his mom um, either made it to the scene or got involved at some point, And they took out a temporary restraining order against this police officer, which again seems odd, right? They live in Howard County. The officer is a Baltimore police officer. Maybe he lives in the area, but they took out a temporary restraining order. It was granted and um, don't know what happened beyond that because again, this happened in 2017. So um, be careful, folks. Um, you know, you never know who you're dealing with. And, and if the young man did something untoward that caused the officer to pull out his weapon. I, I don't know. I don't know the full story, but I, I do know that officers, you know, we don't pull out weapons to intimidate people and scare folks, right? The way I was trained and taught is you pull out a weapon because you're about to use it. So that's what happened with um, Jawan Nelson last year in 2017. So to my um, YouTube, to my YouTube um, family, 
there you go. <laughs> I hope that a um, little bit of commentary um, answers your question with regards to that. By the way, um, if you do have an issue, you know, there's a couple of organizations out there who really are, are doing um, important work with regards to advocating for families. One of them is called Mothers of Black Boys United. Um, and they have a Facebook presence. Um, Vanessa is, I believe, the founder, and we're friends on Facebook. So um, if you have an issue, a concern, or if you need some assistance more than just you by yourself taking on an issue, reach out to Mothers of Black Boys United, M-O-B-B, -B, on Facebook. And you can also reach out to Mothers Against Police Brutality, which is headed by... Um, a woman by the name of Colette Flanagan and, and Miss Flanagan uh, lost her son to police violence. And so she has since started that group. So there's at least two organizations that you can reach out to if you need some guidance or assistance, some direction, if you will. You know, I'm a big advocate of if you have a problem, you need to also go public. Uh, do not allow a police department to act in a vacuum. Everybody has a um, social media presence. And if you have an issue, um, you should articulate it without emotion, chronologically, and with much specificity, either in a tweet or in an email, in a letter, to the head of that particular police department. The next thing I wanted to talk about, um, kind of a little law enforcement um, intrigue, if you will. This involves the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. So I guess the other day they swore in the new sheriff. You know, I mentioned before that there was a former LAPD command staff officer by the name of Jim McDonald who was running for the office of sheriff in Los Angeles County. And he was defeated by a LA County deputy sheriff who held the rank of lieutenant, Alex Villanueva. So it's going down, it's going down at the sheriff's office. Um, they are having a bloodletting akin to the kind that we had on the LAPD when Willie Williams came and was promoted to police chief or was given the position of police chief over Bernard Parks. I talked about that, too, in my podcast, so I'm not going to repeat that here. But there was a, it, it was reported as a bloodletting on the sixth floor over in Parker Center when Willie Williams came, left after one term because... He didn't have a support system around him and he didn't understand LAPD being an outsider. And so he got one term, which was five years. And then Bernard Parks um, was then promoted to police chief. And that's when it got real, real ugly. And so it seems like the same thing is going on over there uh, at CJ, right? <laughs> Alex Villanueva, he ain't playing over there. He told everybody that's above the rank of Everybody with a star and a bar, whatever that is for them. Everybody with a star and a bar, take it off your uniform. Ain't nobody wearing no insignia over there. So I don't know how long that's going to last. And I don't even know if that's a good thing. I don't know what to make of that. But he's shaking it up. He's talked about, um, he's told, according to reports in the uh, LA Times, 500, 500 other supervisors, you may need to find a new church home. And... Um, that their jobs are being reevaluated. So a lot of people are not happy over there. And of course, you, they can't speak on it, you know, without anonymity. Because you know what happens if you're the police and you talk about something that rubs you raw, right? There's no such thing as whistleblower protection. And I have an issue with that because, you know, folks always say, why don't the good cops say anything? They're as, as guilty as the bad cops. Well, I say... Why don't the police chiefs create an environment so that the good cops can tell when officers are misbehaving, when they're violating policy, when they're involved in misconduct, and not have to worry about their own safety, not have to worry about partners maybe putting your life in jeopardy when you're out there in the field because they won't back you, because you may not get the assistance that you need. Police chiefs could create an environment where officers could report misconduct if police chief chiefs really wanted officers to report misconduct. So you understand they allow this stuff to happen, right? Because the police chiefs, the sheriffs, the commissioners, whatever rank they are, they could put an end to this stuff yesterday if they really wanted to. So my guess is that 
they don't really want to. And they've proven that to me and you by paying buckets of monies to families when there's a loss of life. So there's a lot of unhappy people over there at CJ, CJ's County Jail for my non-LAPD, for my non-LA California folks. It's a lot of unhappy people. So he's getting ready to... Um, yeah, he getting ready to do something real different over there. It'll be interesting to see if Villanueva, although he's an insider, but I mean, he was a lieutenant. So it'll be very interesting to see who he surrounds himself with and how successful he is as the new sheriff over there at L.A. County. Now, you know, I don't do political stuff, but, you know, I'm having a I am just beside myself with getting this right now. I am really like a 12 year old with all this stuff that's going on with little Tank Tank and, uh, you know, Cohen and him telling and. You know, today Cohen got three years in uh, federal prison. Allegedly, he can tell some more if he wants to because he doesn't have to turn himself in until sometime in March. So the way I heard it on TV is that he can lessen that three year sentence if he um, has some more information that he wants to share, because it sounds like he might have held some stuff back. That's why the SDNY was so um unforgiving, if you will, with him in terms of they wanted him to get the maximum penalty. They wanted him to get the high range of sentencing based on the guidelines because he hadn't been as forthcoming with them as he had been with with Mueller and his team. But so now a uh, little Tink Tink's trying to change the subject because, you know, that's what he does. He's really good. OK, Barry, March 10th. Thanks for that. Michael Cohen turns himself in March 10th, according to Barry, who is all knowing. Thank you, Barry. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so now he's trying to change the subject. You know, this thing has been sitting around waiting to be voted on and McConnell had no interest in moving it forward. But now there's something called the criminal justice. Uh, there's a criminal justice bill called the first step act. And the first step act has something to do with, um, mandatory minimum sentencing and, you know, who, who goes to jail for what and why and, I guess um, Cory Booker was also uh, instrumental in trying to push this, but they could never get the votes to go forward. So now all of a sudden, little Tink Tink want to, um, you know, he want to make some folks happy and um, make sure that this uh, First Step Act gets passed. And, and, and a lot of this has to do with, um, they said if this bill passes, it has provisions that allow judges to have more discretion in sentencing offenders for nonviolent crime, particularly, particularly drug offenders. And it also aims to improve rehabilitation programs for former prisoners. Now, you know, I, I got kind of excited when I saw the particularly drug offenders, because I'm thinking about this opioid uh, epidemic that's, that's jumping off right now, right? There's much talk about something needs to be done all of a sudden with regards to this opioid and this first step act will certainly help those who um have have an issue with opioids and you know the way the way that got started is that you know people are being uh seeking prescription medication in um and being over 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 prescribed with um Fentanyl? I think fentanyl is the number one. There was a whole thing on the news this morning about the top four or five drugs, fentanyl, and um, I mean, it's past cocaine and heroin now, and it's um, it's it's the number one killer. I think like 18,000 people have died in like the last year or something. It's, it's really, you know, wreaking havoc, and so I'm not um, supporting that, you know, folks don't get help, but it's just very interesting that all of a sudden, now, something needs to be done about this opioid situation. So we'll see what happens. Um, lastly, you know, um, I'm not a, I'm not in the beehive, right? Um, I'm not hating. I just, you know, I just, just it's just, I'm, I'm not a big um, Beyonce fan. But um, there was something that I saw came across my Twitter account where, um, I guess over the weekend, I'm going to put up a picture. It was very pretty. She, um, she, um, she performed at a wedding in India. Beyonce did. She performed at a wedding in India for the richest man in India. I'm trying to get this picture. 
And um, I've seen some of those um, weddings for, you know, the very well to do in India. And when they put on a, when they, when they put on a show, they put on a show. And so um, Beyonce was, um, she was there and performed. Okay, so it's not allowing me to um, show you the picture. Maybe when it's all done, I'll go back on and I'll um, I'll put the picture up for anybody that hasn't seen it. But anyway, she was very pretty. She put on a pre-wedding uh, concert, two million dollars. They say her 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 private parties, her private concerts start at two million dollars. And so this guy, the richest man in India, put this on for his wife, who was also I mean for his daughter, who was also very beautiful. And um, he's worth 130 billion. So, two million dollars or two million plus dollars for a pre-wedding party is probably not, you know, not well. Clearly, it's not a big deal. He's worth 130 billion. He's the richest man. Yeah, Barry, I know. I saw that um, that Hillary was there. Yeah, I saw that Hillary, uh, it was written that, I mean, I didn't see because I wasn't there, but I, I read that Hillary Clinton and um, obviously other notables were there for that um, wedding. But, but um, you know, if you are so inclined and you want to see what it looks like, it was very, very, uh, very lavish, um, very nice, very nice. And the daughter of this gentleman uh, is just beautiful, and I'm just so intrigued by their... Um, their dress, if you will. Um, again, when I get an opportunity, I'll go back and, and put up a picture of both Beyonce, who's in, 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 in Indian type um, garb, and then the daughter. Looks like a formal portrait of, of his daughter, the bride to be. So, that is all I have for you guys today. Listen, um, you know, we talk about this all the time. I had said last week what I wanted for Christmas. It's not too late, right? You guys still making your Christmas list? Uh, we're nearing um, 12 days before Christmas, and so um, you know what I said I wanted. I'm, I'm, I'm easy. I just, I just want subscribers. So that's what I'm asking for for Christmas. I'm asking for new subscribers, for, for you to share me with people that you care about, for you to tell folks um, who mean a lot to you that I exist so that um, we can make sure that they're here through this year and 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 prayer, prayerfully all of 2019 and and the years that follow right so um if you find benefit and I'm sure that you do in in what it is that I say and how I say it with regards to what I think might keep you safe when you're interacting with police officers I make no guarantees I tell you what what I know for sure will get you in trouble, right? Because I know me, right? And I know if, if I pulled you over and you was asking me a bunch of questions, it's going to be a problem. Hey, Fran, it's going to be a problem. So I know what will get you in trouble for sure, for sure. But I don't know what will keep you safe. So I um, want to make sure that everybody understands that holding court curbside with a police officer is not in your best interest. I want you to survive that police encounter. I want to see you all in 2019, and we'll do this a couple of more times before we get up out of 2018. And um, as we go out the door, um, be sure to subscribe to Sergeant Dorsey Speaks podcast. Subscribe to my YouTube channel, Sergeant Dorsey Speaks. And when you get over there, be sure to like it and share it. Subscribe and follow me on Twitter and Instagram, Sergeant Dorsey Speaks. Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey, and that's Sergeant SGT, the abbreviation, right? Stop by my website, SGT, SergeantCherylDorsey.com. Check out my book, Great Stocking Stuffer, Black and Blue, The Creation of a Social Advocate. See you guys next Wednesday. Until then, be good and be safe.